Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our uh, webinar today on unlocking some of the tools that the Loan Programs Office has offered to, to state agencies, particularly the CEPI program. Uh, and thank you to all of the folks who are helping support this, this panel today uh, with us, uh, RMI, S2 State Support Center, and of course, uh, Loan Programs Office. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it to Advay in just a second, but my name is Paul Williams. I'm the Executive Director at Center for Public Enterprise, um, and we're really excited about this and all of the work that uh, states and agencies around the country are doing to make use of these programs and accelerate the uh, clean energy deployment across the country. Advay? Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really great to see you all here to learn about some of the more innovative ways to mobilize financing and decarbonization across our communities. I'm Advait. I'm the Senior Associate for Energy Finance here at CPE, the Center for Public Enterprise. And as you all know, we're discussing today the State Energy Financing Institution carve-out of the Loan Programs Office Title 17 Lending Authority. This lending authority is something that I've been studying the implementation of for some time. Uh, and I really believe that this carve out is one of the most promising ways through which states can funnel billions of dollars towards the climate mitigation and adaptation promises and priorities that we all share. But we wouldn't be here today to talk about it without our partners at RMI and the State Support Center, nor without federal and state leaders whose, whose work we've been admiring so deeply for catalyzing investment into decarbonization and resilience. So right now, let me run through whom you'll be hearing from today. And then after that, we'll go through all of our various presentations. So first, from the Department of Energy's Loan Programs Office, we have Hans Riemer, a senior consultant leading the team working with state governments in designing and deploying clean energy projects. He's a clean energy and greenhousing champion. Then you'll hear from Molly Fried, senior associate at RMI, who works closely with state governments to identify decarbonization policy gaps. She'll be discussing RMI's CEFI playbook, which is a wonderful resource for state federal cooperation and collaboration. Third, you'll hear from my colleague at CPE, Yakov Fagan, our director of public finance. He's an expert on how the public sector and how public sector entities interact with and within the financial system. After which, we'll hear from two amazing state leaders. From the Arizona Finance Authority, we have Executive Director Greg Gelfi, who has a long career of leveraging innovative public finance programs to strategically direct investments into local economic development across Arizona, where he's now leading the state's charge to create finance mechanisms to decarbonize. And from Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro's Office of Critical Investments, we have Abby Catton, Infrastructure Coordinator. She's, she's responsible for securing federal funding for Pennsylvania to assist local governments and businesses with infrastructure investments to meet environmental goals and develop clean energy projects. Now, after hearing how our state leaders plan to implement their LPO collaborations, you'll hear Chirag Lala, CPE's Director of Energy, who leads on industrial policy in the energy sector, project pipelines and institutional design and electricity markets. He's gonna cover CPE's model RFI, a template for how other states, maybe many of you, can begin surveying their project development priorities and possibilities. And we'll close out the afternoon, finally, with a Q&A moderated by Franz Hochstrasser, the Managing Director for Green Finance at the State Support Center, who works day and night to support state green banks in designing ambitious decarbonization programs. So as we proceed through this webinar, please feel free to throw questions into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, Franz will pick up some of them at the end for all of us to chew on together. But I should say that this webinar is intended for local, state, and federal officials and policymakers and for researchers and implementation experts who are working alongside them through nonprofit advocacy and technical assistance organizations. We'll do our best to answer all questions that come our way. Some will be in the chat, many of them will be at the Q&A afterwards, but you should know that we're prioritizing questions from those specific audiences, given that we're talking about how projects get developed and how they get financed. This meeting will be recorded and we'll be able to post the slides on the RMI event page afterwards, so stay tuned for that if you'd like to come back to this material. We'll also have a set of linked resources that we'll email to everybody after the event and put on the event webpage. If you have any questions, especially if there are things discussed today that you're not familiar with or want to hear again, you should definitely get in touch, and we'll have all of our emails available to you after this as well. With that, 
I'm now going to turn it over to Hans Riemer from the Loan Programs Office to uh, get us started. And uh, I'll share his slides momentarily. Thank you, Edvate. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate all of the organizers and sponsors for today's uh, webinar. We're going to hear about the Loan Programs Office, uh, not only from LPO, but from organizations that are working really hard with states to help advance our mission. And uh, we're grateful for your leadership and, and your collaboration. And um, as a preface to the slides that I'll share, the way that the Loan Programs Office works with states or with companies that are applying is a little different than the way that you might expect a federal agency with a funding award program. You know, typically, the federal agency isn't collaborating with the applicant because there has to be a, a real separation there. But with the Loan Programs Office, it's different. We work closely with applicants and with partners in order to really understand the application that we're reviewing. And we do weekly calls, we do bi-weekly calls, we delve into every aspect of the project in the smallest details. So if what you hear today is interesting, we want to work with you. We're, we're here to set up a regular cadence of conversations to explain our authority. And these organizations are knowledgeable about our authority as well, and they can share information with you. Um, but you can come directly to us and we'll, we'll, we'll partner with you. Uh, I'm Hans Riemer. I'm a senior consultant at the Loan Programs Office, where there are several of us who work day in and day out with states and state agencies, and we help match our financing opportunity to their, their strategies and to support state strategies that qualify for LPO. Uh, we are the premier public financing partner at, in the federal government. At, we are the lending authority at the Department of Energy. We provide high impact loans for big projects that are creating energy and jobs and financing uh, critical investments in our infrastructure. We have tens of billions of dollars of, of loan authority that's available, and we have multiple loan programs. So we're focusing today on Title 17 and the State Energy Financing Institution Authority, but note that we have a tribal loan authority. So if you have a potential tribal project, we have a advanced vehicles loan authority. So we have multiple loan authorities with different parameters, and we wanna to talk to you about those. Next. We have uh, over 200 projects in our pipeline in all 50 states. We have hundreds of billions of dollars worth of loan requests that we are working through in every sector of the economy, from renewables to nuclear to vehicles to transmission, uh, wind, energy storage, you name it. We're, we're actively engaged in that sector and helping American companies build their competitiveness. As I said, we're, we have projects in all, all the states and in all the regions. You can see LPO is a valuable resource to economies, state economies all across the country uh, with projects everywhere. Next. We are different from a big bank because we are truly in it for the long haul. There's no point at which we want to foreclose on a project and take our money out, we want to stick with that project as long as possible and help that project succeed through rocky times, perhaps. And we have a record of doing that. So we are really committed partners with very flexible, tailored financing solutions, and we are patient capital. Next. There are certain prerequisites a project needs to show a meaningful greenhouse gas reduction impact. It needs to be an energy related project. Uh, and it has to have a reasonable prospect of repayment. One of the questions we often get is, do you provide grants? Can I convert a loan to a grant? We are a lending authority that is charged by Congress with the obligation to ensure that we can be repaid. So we do a tremendous amount of diligence in order to ensure that there is indeed a reasonable prospect of repayment. So that's really why we have such a close partnership with our applicants. Next. 
Okay, so I am going to focus in, and this webinar does, on the State Energy Financing Institution Program, where historically the Loan Programs Office finances projects with an innovative technology. We are standing up new industries, new breakthroughs, where there isn't affordable financing otherwise available. Now we have the authority, thanks to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we have the authority to finance projects that are using commercialized technologies, off-the-shelf solutions. Historically, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We can do that now if a state agency or quasi-public agency is a co-investor with us. So what we are going to hear about is how states could approach that, how agencies can approach that. So when a, a CEFI, what we, we call a CEFI, it's just a state agency that backs energy projects, when one of these agencies is making a meaningful investment, then we're allowed to waive the innovation requirement and finance a conventional solution for renewables or storage or buildings, something along those lines. Next. So what is a CEFI? What is a state agency that finances energy projects? Well, take a look at your state. What agencies have done that in the past? Often energy projects have been supported by an economic development authority because it that project creates jobs. Or maybe the housing agency has financed a building decarbonization. Or maybe the state has a green bank. That's obviously kind of the natural uh, partner, but actually the law is embraces all of these and, and more. So most states would have multiple agencies that have a record of supporting energy projects. So if you're a, a state, you can look at the Department of Commerce or the Department of Economic Development, the Economic Development Authority, the Energy Office itself, or maybe an entity within the Energy Office or an entity within one of the other agencies. Just trace the history of support for projects and then we'll evaluate that to see if that is indeed what we call a CEFI, which again, is an agency or quasi-public agency that backs energy projects. Next. Now, as described, we can lend to a project when the project is has an investment from a state. So that's a visual on the screen now, the state as the green slice investor, the blue as below that as the project's equity requirement and LPO with the major piece of debt financing on the top. Um, I'm going to move pretty quickly now, so uh, this will seem abbreviated, but another approach is if the state wants to be a borrower. The state can do that through our loan authority and be a public project developer. Uh, in either case, there's a meaningful investment required from the CEFI, there's an equity requirement, there's a debt requirement. Next. We have lots of requirements for our financing. Um, some of the limitations are, we are not gonna be able to finance more than 80% of the cost of a project. And we generally recommend the project seek to borrow at least $100 million from us. Um, our treasury plus three eighths plus risk premium rates are, are published on our website. And projects can't benefit from other federal financing. They can use tax credits, but generally not other financing. Okay. Uh, why don't I wrap it up there and we will get into project concepts as we proceed through the discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hans. And now we'll transition to Molly. Awesome. Thanks, Hans. Um, and I think Ava, you'll share my slides as well, but I'll hop into it. Um, great to be here today presenting alongside so many friends and collaborators and with such great attendance. So thank you all. Um, my name is Molly Freed. I'm a senior associate at RMI on the state ambition team. So I basically work with state agencies and advocates to advance clean energy policy at the state level. And today I'm going to be talking about a resource that we are releasing this week. Was hoping to have it out before this webinar, but um, you'll get it in your post event packet. But it's called the CEFI Program Playbook for States. Uh, which we developed after lots of conversations with um, green banks around the country, some of whom I've seen um, on this call, uh, conversations with some of my fellow panelists, with LPO, and with uh, sector level experts at RMI. Uh, next slide. So 
for those of you who are unfamiliar with RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute, we're an independent, nonpartisan organization of experts. Uh, we work across disciplines to accelerate a clean energy transition that works for everyone. Uh, next slide. Thanks. And great, one of the things that we've been pretty undeniably seeing through our work is that that clean energy transition in the US is happening now. Um, this data from the Clean Investment Monitor shows domestic investment in clean energy quadrupling over the last six years, uh, varying by region, of course. But on the next slide, as most of us on this call know, this is in large part due to the tax credits and other incentives uh, that were provided through the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. And the thing about these tax credits is that they are untapped and therefore they just have this massive amount of potential. So a big part of my job is actually working with states to make sure that they're doing everything in their power to maximize the uptake of these tax credits, whether that's um, you know, facilitating uptake from everyday retail consumers or looking at what um, ways to encourage utilities or developers on some of the larger scale projects. Uh, and obviously the problem, the main problem with larger scale projects is that capital is expensive right now. Um, and this you know, disproportionately affects a lot of clean energy projects, which tend to have a higher capex and more risk, which means that a lot of the types of projects that we're trying to encourage are getting hit with, we're seeing of upwards of 7% interest rates, which is starting to slow down this growth and um, cap the potential of these tax credits. So, that's a really big part of the reason that we see such a great opportunity with LPO's new CEFI program. So by working with LPO to provide access to cheaper capital, it's one of the biggest things that states can do to enable a whole bunch of private investment in their region. Um, and obviously the benefits go beyond just attracting private capital. So depending on how the CEFI is structured, the state can really work to direct the investment into their priority sectors. Uh, they can ensure that cost savings are passed on to both you know, rate payers or consumers and also ensure that um, some types of projects are driving construction and more permanent jobs, um, growing the local tax base and also improving air quality for residents. Plus uh, the backing provided by you know, a reliable state and federal investment can make it easier for these developers to raise additional financing. So this is where the new playbook comes in. Um, like I said, it should be released later this week and sent out with the slides and the recording, but um, this will serve as a little teaser. Um, so the idea for the playbook is to really show states why they should set up a SEPI program. Um, what types of projects uh, should and shouldn't be used for, and how to go about um, starting the process as efficiently as possible. So we structured the playbook into three pieces of guidance for the states, which all kind of have to happen concurrently, so they're numbered, but imagine doing all these things at once, basically. Um, and the first is to identify your project pipeline. Um, I was we're going to be talking about a lot of different project examples. Hans went through a lot. I think we'll talk through some more um, later in the webinar, but um, there's lots of different types of ways to kind of drum up uh, potential projects in your state. I uh, kind of think about it as inbound and outbound leads. So on the inbound side, you can start by publishing an RFI or an RFQ or whatever you do in your state. Um, like Abed said, we'll be hearing a little later from CPE on their RFI template. So I'm not gonna go into detail on that now. Just to say that this is a good option to get a sense of kind of where the private sector is at, what the level of um, private interest is and where there might be shovel ready projects um, out in your state already. And then on the outbound side of things, we have a few options suggested here. So uh, first is to start with EPA's flight database, which stands for the um, facility level uh, information on greenhouse gases tool. They took, I think, a few liberties with that acronym, but um, you can find the top five or 10 most polluting facilities in your state. So if there are um, low and medium heat um, opportunities at the manufacturing level, those retrofits could be a good fit, um, along with maybe gas collection systems from landfills. Um, you might see some high heat industries like cement and steel uh, and power plants up there in the top section. 
um, those are a better fit for other types of financing. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, fleet conversion could be a good option for SAFI. So really going after the big public and private fleets in the state, especially if they have any um, public emission reduction targets, depending on the size of the fleets and whether we're talking about light or medium and heavy duty vehicles, um, this could either be done using the CEFI as a borrower project or the CEFI as an investor, as Hans kind of outlined earlier, those two structures. Uh, you can also use RMI's new clean growth tool. Oh, I'll add that in the links that we send out to everyone uh, to identify the highest feasibility clean energy industries within your state uh, based on existing workforce and related industry capabilities, and then work with your economic development office uh, to kind of recruit these industries to construct new manufacturing facilities or renovate existing facilities to locate in your state, that's a great option. And then lots of opportunities on the building side of things, um, especially campus-wide retrofits in the MUSH market, uh, MUSH acronym for municipal buildings, universities, schools, and hospitals. So just because of the scale of those types of um, campuses, those can likely hit the $130, $150 million threshold that will allow the CEFI to, to basically just be the investor. But if the state is interested in scaling up a bunch of smaller retrofits, they can work with their local um, ESCOs, energy service companies to aggregate projects across the state. Okay, sorry, that was a lot on one side, but um, when I talk to states about these types of projects within this new era of federal support, one of the most common questions I get is basically, how do I know what program I should be using to pay for this project, this thing I want to do. So on the next slide, we have a kind of generic capital stack with options of how to piece together different funding streams from grants and tax credits to state tax dollars and public and private loans. Um, obviously, most projects, uh, developers are eager to kind of prioritize the options at the top and minimize what's going on in the bottom. So on the next slide, where we see CEFI being most appropriate is for these really big projects where states aren't using federal grants, maybe they applied and didn't get them, or maybe it's not a good fit for the type of project or the tax incentives are, you know, even more generous than a grant might be. Um, but there's also ideally already some state interest in the type of project, maybe there's some budget set aside. Um, these, this kind of like rough outline is where we really love to see um, CEFI as a, a good fit. Okay, my next slide, I think, is one of the most important graphics I have in my presentation. There's a much more detailed version of this in the playbook. Um, but CEFI is a super exciting opportunity. We are, am I really, everyone on this panel is really excited about it. But it's almost more important to not try to force it for projects where it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to try to break it down for you at a high level here. Um, basically, any project that's smaller than, I know Hans said 130 million, we round it up a little bit, 150 million. Um, any project that's smaller than that and without the potential to bundle a bunch of those projects across the state, it's probably gonna make more sense to use private lenders or use GGRF um, just because the amount of work that it takes to secure an LPO loan um, really only makes sense when you're receiving that $100 million or so. And this is obviously not cut and dry. I know Hans would always say, talk to him if you have something even within the ballpark. Um, but in general, this program is not gonna make sense for these one-off smaller projects. Then if a project is being developed by a municipality or a big company with really good credit, it might be cheaper for them to actually just take advantage of that credit rating and use the private capital that they have access to. Um, especially because this means they don't have to use, like do a NEPA review or meet some of the, you know, Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements, which, which might be a barrier for some types of projects, like if you're bundling a bunch of single family home retrofits. Uh, next, if a project's replacing or reducing emissions from existing fossil infrastructure, they should be using LPO's energy infrastructure reinvestment. Ooh, I hope I got that acronym right, EIR program. Uh, because that program doesn't include that additional risk-based charge that CEFI projects do. And then finally, uh, depending on the state, projects that utilize innovative technology will probably find it easier to just use LPO's innovative energy or supply chain technology pathway since they don't have to secure that state support, which might just be a little bit um, more coordination. And that includes things like geothermal, offshore wind, uh, small modular nuclear um, and hydrogen. So that's why earlier when I said high heat industrial retrofits, power plants, um, 
you know, those things that require fuel switching to hydrogen and CCUS are likely better suited to that pathway. Okay, so that's the project pipeline. I'm happy to take questions about that, but um, once states have really identified their projects or, or pipelines, they need to figure out which entity will serve as our CEFI. Hans already covered this, but just to say that there's lots of different ways to think about this. Um, if you have multiple agencies that meet CEFI qualifications, you can have them run their own CEFI programs with their own priorities and sectoral focuses, um, like in Massachusetts, or you can have multiple agencies that work together to like pool their funding, align their investments um, into one CEFI program, uh, like they're doing in Michigan with their economic development office and their state energy office. Okay, next slide. Um, finally, states need to decide what kind of meaningful support they're going to provide to their project pipeline. So I think this is where state agencies should start getting excited on you know, looking at this slide, because based on conversations that we're having with leading states and project teams around the country, we're seeing that states can provide as little as one to 5% of a total project cost, depending on the amount of risk that the state takes on with that investment. Um, it's obviously case by case, and um, LPO really wants to see some skin in the game, so they take that into account when they're deciding what they can be considered meaningful support. So um, this little graphic shows some of the factors that LPO might take into account when they're deciding whether a state meets this threshold. Um, okay, final slide. All this being said, obviously 5% of project costs from one of these massive projects is not nothing, especially for some of the smaller states that might be on this call or states without um, a lot of budget that's been allocated to climate investments. So in these cases, I think I saw that Connecticut's on the call. So states like Connecticut, I think are exploring the opportunity to pool funds across multiple green banks within a region and then work with a nationwide company um, or companies with a nationwide portfolio to deploy projects in those states. And that could be a great fit for some of the private fleet companies or building retrofit projects. Um, so just to say this is an option if one to 5% of um, a project cost is still kind of scary to your state. Okay, um, so with that, happy to hand it off to Jakob to talk more about the CEFI as borrower structure. Um, if you have any questions about RMI's work with states overall or about the state playbook, feel free to shoot me an email um, here. And the playbook will be posted at this QR code with all the other event materials, I think by the end of the week. Um, and so thank you so much for attending. Hope to chat with you more during the Q&A portion. Thank you very much, Molly. Um, and so on. So I'm Yaakov, I work on sustained public finance at CPE. And some of what I will be saying is very similar to Molly, but I, so we'll be getting into slightly more specific project structure. So, um, well, um, so I think in general, as an overview, since 2020, we've had a very quiet revolution in fiscal federalism. Since the 70s, states have largely been grant takers from the federal government. Um, Slowly but surely, starting with some of the COVID recovery bills, moving into bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA, federal programs are starting to look at states more like co-investors and pipeline originators than they are grant takers. And CEFI is kind of, I think, the most clear example of that, but not the only one. So states' jobs under IRA has become to originate a pipeline for capital investment. And that's a multi-step process. It's a process of identifying your needs, gathering your information and planning, which is why both RMI and ourselves, we emphasize the importance of the RFI and RFQ process. Coordinating not just with the private sector, but with your municipalities and tribes and publicly planned, uh, publicly infrastructure organizations, creating portfolios, and this is what we'll talk about a bit more, that optimize the financing structures available for, from the federal government, the private sector, and the state. Establishing 
your construction and uh, and uh, and contractor pipelines and doing it in a way that is has people that know how to do these projects are pre-vetted and can take up these loans quite well. And then figuring out how these capital assets you've created are operated, who's doing the operation, doing the O&M, and how value and revenues are split out from those. What I want to emphasize is what we want to build and what we're building here are capital assets. So they are assets that create cash flow and future value which should be understood as something that is both monetizable and something that has to be divided amongst all the actors once the loans are paid out. Um, so I think what's very important to take away from this and to think about is that CEFI isn't just a source of capital, it's an opportunity to set up a, a, a pipeline. It's an opportunity for you to go to your municipalities, go to your private sector, go to other co-investors and ask, hey, what is out there and what can we help facilitate? What can we be partners with? Because we have access to something rather large and that might be rather cheap as a source of financing. That requires a lot of building internally, including something like, for example, as we emphasize creating a tiger team from multiple departments, which can pool your engineering, your finance, and other expertise as they exist within the state. You will have these in little pieces across your state, even if you don't have a CEFI set up. It just is something you have to look for. And again, thinking about what you're investing now, how it sets you up for new investments, new opportunities, new streams of revenue that can be recycled later. So just as a quick summary, the CEFI carve out can be cheap and as Molly emphasized, but it's not always the cheapest option. However, it is cheaper, the less investment grade your credit is as uh, in compared to private markets. However, what it also does is it gives you volume. It gives you certain parts may be advantages over to, on tax credits. So if you're issuing a municipal uh, in tax for municipal bond, you don't get penalties on elective pay, for example. And it lets you increase it lets you get volume below uh, outside of your possibly your borrowing caps and issue volumes into specific places and specific projects where they might be needed. And here is where I kind of want to get to the meat of this presentation, which is the SPV structure why it's so important. First of all, CEFI projects that we've discussed need to be of a certain size. There's a 100 million uh, minimum size though it may actually have gone up, we'll ask Hans. Um, um, but that doesn't mean it's one single asset you can be financing. You could be financing a portfolio of related projects that you are pipelining financing in. Um, that's important because that means you can group various projects that have come out of your RFI and RFQ process into the optimal financing spaces. So for example, some projects might make sense as capital market projects. Some projects are a little riskier and their CEFI may, might make more sense. Some projects are a little smaller. You might want to go to G and one off. You might want to go to GGRF but you can compartmentalize those into separate legal and institutional pipelines through your SPV processes. And the SPV, again, will have has a capital stack, when Molly already showed us, um, that is capitalized as a, sta as a single entity rather than each individual project pipeline. Again, what you should be thinking about is the leverage, right? With and the and using essentially tools that any private investor would think about as a public entity to create new value streams. So if you're a double A rated straight state instrumentality and you're building a triple B rated energy project, you can conserve your double A uh, rating via non-recourse lending. And that's where it might make sense to create a specific CEFI dependent portfolio. Um, you can shield your credit rating and create more 
uh, more leverage for the product. And that's something you should be thinking about, in my opinion, as developers. Um, I will give an example. I'd like to move on to, you know, the actual practitioners and states very quickly, but I think one of the easy low hanging fruits we've seen some states engage with and we'll hear from further is a school solarization pipeline. So uh, we have a, in which we have multiple school sites, none of which will hit their minimums as individual projects, but make sense as a set of projects that are relatively similar, have the same kind of underwriting and credit risks being used as uh, being used and capitalized with the CEFI program. Um, in this, in these projects, the state instrumentality will provide the sponsor equity, so the initial equity investment into the SPV that is sourced using usually debt or whatever instruments you're using on your state balance book. There will be other equity or debt that could be sourced from other sources, which all count as meaningful support, and that might be uh, further loans. It could be land le uh, it could be land leases or in kind support. Uh, tax credits from state programs could theoretically be folded in and um, as is philanthropic or outside uh, outside capital with the LPO then coming in at the to fill out the rest of the capital stack. From there, we have certain design decisions um, on how to split the value of the new solar installs. In some cases, we and very commonly, we will see a the schools um, the schools running uh, a lease back program with the state bank. So uh, with the state entity that sponsored this. So for example, so this is basically a public public partnership. One th other advantage of that kind of program is that it takes away the administration, especially of tax credit monetization away from the school and into the central entity that's running the SPV, which allows you to just monetize the tax credits and also bridge finance them up front, which is very important, into, uh, um, uh, into one place and reduce the project costs uh, on the back end via the tax credits. And what the school participant will see would just be the straight savings from either the PPA or the lease buyback. Um, and again, this has all the elements of a neat project pipeline because what you have is outreach to your municipalities, your school districts, which are looking and thinking of finding ways to solarize to then create energy bill savings. Um, you have a natural, a natural set of uptake there. You have the SPV, which is crowding together these unlike projects into like financeable entities. And then you have leverage coming from your LPO loans. And then you have a decision about one, monetizing the tax credits, monetizing bill payment savings, monetizing other things that might be enabled in your state. For example, your RECs, for example, any uh, VPP program incentives that might exist. And in the future, as the grid changes and as regulation changes, maybe longer term co-ownership options over things like storage, over things like microgrids and others and other revenue generating assets that might come on board. That's a very generic description, a very effective one of how we can pipeline ELP projects and incentivize them using LPO capital. I'm gonna finish a bit early just to make sure we are not running over time. Sweet, thank you Yakov. I believe next we have, um, we're going to be switching to presentations from our state leaders. We'll start with Greg in Arizona. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on here. I'm Greg Gelfi with the Arizona Finance Authority. Um, it's a state agency that I'll go to when we get the presentation up front. So they've asked to talk about the the request for information that we did alongside with the Office of Resiliency. Um, next slide. 
the Office of Resiliency, Arizona Finance Authority has existed about eight years. Um, it's primarily involved in private activity bonds and volume cap. Um, but in, in starting uh, about a year ago, realized that there's a, has a lot more authority to, you know, to do tax exempt bonds on its own, to own property and to sort of become a finance entity within the state. I'll call it sort of a forward looking finance entity. So looking at outside with outside of the state agency itself, but helping businesses, cities, towns, et cetera, um, with finance uh, mechanisms. And then the governor's office of resiliency was created with Governor Hobbs about a year and a half ago to help with you know green energy, help with develop programs, rebate programs, and uh, you know get federal grants to help you know basically update the infrastructure um, in different parts of the state. And just kind of going backwards, the Department of Energy was a, did exist, but it got uh, the last administration got rid of that. So this is is playing a number of different roles within the state. Next slide. So the RFI, the, um, when we when about December, November, we started talking with the Department of Energy about their CEFI program and kind of what it would take to become a CEFI as a state. You know, and at the time, there was sort of talk about, you know, just you have, might, you have the authority, you can become a CEFI. And then that changed over time to we really want to find projects that that states can do, sponsor projects. And, and so when we were talking to them, we decided to put out a, an RFI that would initially talking about just CEFI, so larger larger projects, $100, $150 million. Then the more we talked with them and with the Office of Resiliency, we thought, well, why, why don't we just put this out in general for green energy projects? So not limiting it to the you know $100 million projects, but anything over a million dollars. And the idea behind it was to you know, look at the greenhouse gas reduction fund that's coming, obviously the, the CEFI program, but also just any of the loan programs that could come through the Department of Energy and then you know, direct pay and tax credits. Uh, next slide. So the, this area of interest was really run by the Office of Resiliency and through the governor's office. And sort of that focus is the focus of what the governor is trying to focus on, you know, for energy programs. So you know, high quality, affordable housing is pretty you know, obvious one. Clean transportation, um, innovative approaches to, you know, clean resistant grid benef grids. Um, Cool roofs, which is in, you know, if, if you're from, if you've ever been to Phoenix this time of year, you understand what that means. But the idea is but behind that is, you know, you have solar, obviously, but it, here, if you put a rooftop in a certain way, you, you actually lower the um, overall, the the building costs for, for energy. Um, and it generally lowers kind of the, the, the idea of lowering the temperature throughout the, throughout the city. Uh, and then, then, you know, clean energy projects related to water treatment, which is another area that Arizona is very interested in, is, you know, water. So, next slide. So we put this out in beginning of May, and we initially gave it a two-month run to see what we would get. Um, and we sort of put it out there to different agencies, um, economic development agencies, city, town um, groups, and, and sort of a, a mass email that the Office of Resiliency had. And our responses were uh, initially started up very slow. And then the last couple of weeks of this, we got 66 responses in total um, through the end of June. Um, 23 were housing focused. So a lot of affordable housing. They often are doing already kind of doing green energy or lead type projects anyway, but this was kind of looking at um, kind of looking at whatever funds are in addition to what they're already getting. Um, 23 towns and cities, which I found pretty interesting. Um, again, a lot of water projects that came from them. Um, and then three larger projects that I would kind of, kind of say would fit the CEFI mold, um, two of which we've sent off to the Department of Energy to kind of look through. Um, and then one of them was already talking to them. Um, and that was a, a Native America tribal one. And then uh, 15 early stage projects, which are, for the most part, very early. So uh, you know, very startup type projects, not necessarily fitting for funding, direct funding, but um, also very interesting projects that are worth 
looking at and reviewing as they as they get bigger. And then the last two are sort of I'd call community outreach, which are not really directly related to finance, but we're out there trying to help, you know, put out the word. Next slide. So what's next with these? Um, we've connected to, we have a Arizona Green Bank who are working with um, the NCIF, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. They're contacting directly the affordable housing projects and talking to them, out, them and just seeing what makes sense. Um, if you're familiar with it, with some of the you know, greenhouse gas reduction funds, which I'm sure all of you are, that's you know that's an in process from our perspective, in process of how those are going to get out there and how the money is going to be spent. I think those probably next three or four months we should know a lot more about that. Um, the other part is connecting them obviously with the CEFI with Department of Energy, and then looking at tax credits, direct pay, and you know working with consultants or you know, starting to talk to consultants about how those projects can benefit from that. And then uh, the last way is just kind of keeping them informed as we learn more about these different programs and, you know, helping them, you know, long-term helping them fund the projects um, or get the projects off the ground and, and again, continue sort of the expansion of carbon reduction that we're looking to do here. And that's it. I think we're doing questions afterwards. Yes, we'll be doing Q&A after this is done. Um, thanks so much, Greg, and we'll hear from you shortly. Next, we have Abby. Hi, everyone. Uh, Abby Cadden from Governor Shapiro's Office of Critical Investments. I will pull up my PowerPoint here in just a moment. like it won't split screens. Okay, so I'll just speak off the cuff. Um, so I'm, as I said, Abby Ken from Governor Shapiro's Office of Critical Investments. Um, my office's role is primarily to um, uh, attract as much funding from the Inflation Reduction Act as possible to Pennsylvania and build out um, as many programs to uh, implement those dollars as possible. And um, one of my roles, I, I work closely with our Green Bank, the Pennsylvania Energy Development Authority. And um, the Energy Authority was developed way back in 1982 um, in response to the oil crisis, but it was kind of this really unique uh, energy project, clean energy project financing tool that was just kind of put up on a shelf and collected dust since 82. And, you know, the, the IRA came along and um, you gave us a reason to revitalize that this this body. And um, so PETA, it, it's a um, quasi government. It's an independent authority with the board of directors representing both public and private institutions. And um, Petty, PETA received its CEFI designation just last year in 2023. So, um, you know, we, we have a lot of ambitious goals to stand up innovative projects and expand access to and accelerate the deployment of uh, clean energy technology. So today I just wanted to kind of highlight three major initiatives we have going through PETA as, you know, exercising its, PETA, its CEFI status. Um, with the Department of Energy. And, you know, the, these are all opportunities that wouldn't have really been available to us without the financing mechanisms through uh, LPO. So uh, first off, we have Solar for Schools. And, um, you know, it's no surprise there that schools routinely have to make difficult budgetary decisions. So when their boiler breaks down or their asbestos needs to be remediated, those are the kind of capital projects that will take preference and priority over co competing investments like, um, you know, solar arrays or geothermal and things like that. So in response, uh, PETA is working to secure a hundred million dollar loan guarantee through LPO um, to finance solar projects on over a hundred schools in Pennsylvania. 
And under this framework, PETA will pay for all the project related expenses with no out of cost, po uh, out of pocket costs to the school district. And then we'll establish a 0% interest rate. So um, schools will just pay back the loan to PETA basically on an annual basis. And that's through their energy savings. So, um, and we amortized it over like 20 years, but then the school gets certain recs like the Act 129 benefits and the, the S recs and the other incentives that are available. So, um, you know, it, we were fortunate also that our legislature um, most recently appropriated 25 million to help subsidize these projects. So that'll be part of our meaningful contribution or equity contribution to fund um, you know, those 100 schools that we're looking to do. And when we decided to go with LPO, it was really because we thought they had the most flexible financing options when you compare it to other um, financing opportunities in the market, um, especially when you look at the tax credit and you really don't want to get that 15% deduction using the tax exempt bonds or something like that. So um, you know, that's why we decided to go with LPO. And I think it's important like, to highlight that schools want this. We have schools uh, in the queue lined up, you know, knocking on doors and, you know, some schools wanting to put their projects on delay because, uh, or on delay be so that they can go through our program because it will end up being a much better um, kind of business model for them to get projects done. And what's really great about this program structure is that we can use Cefi to replicate this model to fund other project concepts like heat pumps for municipalities or biodigesters for farmers. So, um, you know, I, the, the slide I had has like kind of a mock up of one of the schools and the design for their, their roofs and um, with the solar panels. And then next to it is this giant coal um, furnace in their basement and it's just like ominous and huge and the the contrast between the two um, you know old technologies versus you know collecting dust in their basement versus kind of new modern ways of uh, producing energies it was just it was really fascinating so uh, for our next um, initiative that we're doing that is all around hydropower so Pennsylvania, we are blessed with a lot of waterways. Uh, we have 3,362 non-powered dams and the state itself owns several hundred of those. So, um, you know, unsurprisingly, this is all very like legacy infrastructure that's over a hundred years old. And um, these dams, they don't function correctly and they're in hazardous condition. A lot of high hazard dams in Pennsylvania. So, at PETA, we're planning to use LPO CEFI loan guarantee to revitalize all this aging infrastructure, you know, turn these liabilities into assets. So we want to rehab these dams and, um, you know, they're in need of repair. So why not spec out hydropower at the same time? And that really just seems like a no brainer for us um, to put this infrastructure into productive use and create um, a ca cash flow uh, uh, source for the state. So, um, and I think a benefit there is too, it, it's, this is sitting infrastructure that we have and um, it really doesn't need a lot of maintenance or, or work um, once it's in place. And then we, you can have royalty payments coming in to help um, go back to fund the state environmental programs and regulatory programs or whatever you want and you know possibly a revolving loan program for other clean energy projects so um and i think that's a great example of how you know one of the goals of the inflation reduction act being this public private partnership um you know it's a state asset but we're gonna we're working with private developers who are really interested in getting low head dams in production online um, across the country. And um, a lot of developers are really excited about the Inflation Reduction Act and how we as a CEFI can play a role in that. So one more um, opportunity we're pursuing right now, there are about 250,000 acres of abandoned mine lands in Pennsylvania. And many of these properties 
continue to pose you know, environmental health and just general safety risks unless they're thoughtfully addressed. And we're fortunate to receive funding under the IRA to restore these abandoned mine lands in combination with LPO funding, we can take advantage of this opportunity to develop new energy generating assets. So earlier this year, my team put out a public call for concept papers for um, to gauge the private sector's interest in designing, developing, and commercializing clean energy campuses in Pennsylvania. Um, and, and it's it, on abandoned mine lands owned by the state. So through these concept paper submissions, we're seeing real tangible interest from the private sector in making these large scale investments. Um, and, and this particular clean energy campus concept would be going through LPO's 1706 program. So not the CEFI, but PETA as a CEF, it's, it's an, another example of how PETA could go through CEFI if we wanted to, you know, as a CEFI. Um, but um, yeah, so those are three of kind of the major initiatives that we're working on through PETA. And, you know, I said PETA is, you know, it was created in the 80s, but, um, you know, we're really an emerging green bank because of the, the IRA. And there wasn't really a way to get ourselves off the ground, you know, barring any appropriation um, from the legislature with you know, without this LPO funding, that's what's going to help us lift up and take off and get these projects funded um, and start creating revenue streams to then support for, for other projects further. So, um, you know, those are the three examples I wanted to highlight today, and I'm happy to talk about them more um, later on if anyone has any questions. But um, yeah, so thank you. Sweet. Thanks so much, Abby. And now I'll transition back to Chirag. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, Advait, do we have the slides up for everyone to view? You bet. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so once again, hello, everyone. My name is Chirag Lala, and I'm the Director of Energy Policy here at Center for Public Enterprise. Now uh, we can go to the next slide. So what I'm going to briefly talk you talk you through is how you might get started. Uh, depending on the histories of your various offices or your institutions, you may or may not have experience with project development or project finance, and you know, in all likelihood, maybe not even experience with the kind of process that's been described here uh, for getting financial assistance from the LPO depending on the other financial tools that you might use either from your respective states or from, for example, the tax credits uh, in the IRA, this is, a, this is a complicated process to string together. We're talking, you know, involvement with uh, contractors, developers, external partners, coordination um, with the LPO, which of course stands ready to provide assistance and feedback of, of, of various kinds and potentially coordination with other uh, state offices and stakeholders. So there's there's quite a lot to to piece together to make large projects like these work. And and you know we're very cognizant of that, as is the LPO and as is everybody else uh, who's been presenting to you today. What we wanted to offer you is an optional mechanism by which you might start laying the groundwork for making use of uh, these authorities um, and thinking through the kinds of projects you might want to pursue. I want to emphasize what I'm talking about is optional. It's it's not required. You can talk to the LPO at any stage of the process you might be, even if you are just kind of brainstorming uh, potential project use cases or just want to run through some of the information that was described here today. Um, and the reason we want to offer you uh, what is a model RFI in order to solicit information on this is because of what my previous co-presenters have emphasized. This is a very, very involved process. It's not like applying for a grant. It's much more akin to working with a bank or acting in your own capacities as developers or coordinators of projects. And so you, you really want to frame the information you're looking for uh, to your potential counterparties a certain way. So what we did is we put together a model RFI document. It's available on our website. I'm going to show you pictures of it uh, in a moment, but it's designed so that you can, one, tell external audiences, you know, you're interested in this, you're thinking about it, and ask them 
any number of questions that might be appropriate for you. You know, what kinds of projects are you all interested in? If you were to tell them that you're interested in providing certain kinds of financial assistance or meaningful support, what kinds of projects might they be interested in looking through or pursuing? Uh, what kinds of opportunities do they see in the market or the sector if certain conditions uh, were amenable, right? These are all the kinds of questions you might ask them because you wanna put on their radars that you're thinking about this and that this opportunity is available, but you also want information from them on what might be possible and what might made to what might be made to be possible if certain circumstances were were altered and changed, right? It's a, it's a way to get these critical conversations started because if you move forward, you know you're going to be working very very closely with them. You're going to be coordinating very very closely uh, with them. So, uh, next slide, please. Again, I just want to emphasize here that this is this RFI is, is not meant to be a prerequisite. It's certainly also not meant to be final. It's absolutely okay to do a first cut of this just so you have a sense of what all you are working with. And so uh, the RFI is uh, approximately four or five pages and you know we put it together uh, in order to one, encapsulate a lot of the information you've heard here today, to leave it open to plenty of different institutions, public, private, nonprofit, or otherwise, to answer and to make clear to them that it could be any number of projects. Uh, projects, And, you know, certainly the LPO, but also Center for Public Enterprise and others you've uh, talked to here today would, would stand ready to assist in customizing this, I believe, to, you know, answer whatever kinds of additional needs you might have to narrow the scope of the questions you want to ask or to expand them uh, as you all feel appropriate. Again, this this tool is meant for you um, and you know we want to help you craft the kind of information gathering mechanisms that you feel necessary. Thank you so much everyone. Amazing. Thanks so much, Chirac. And I think with that, I'd like to invite all the panelists back to uh, having their videos on and back on Zoom to start our Q&A with Franz moderating. Thanks so much, Franz. I'll let you take it away from here. Amazing. Um, well, I hope everyone is as excited as I am about uh, the presentations we just heard. Uh, some fantastic, very detailed information. Now is your chance to ask the questions of our wonderful panelists, um, anything and everything. And many of you have already put those into the chat. Um, so thank you for that. Um, as, as a reminder, I'm Franz Hochstrasser, a Managing Director of Finance at the S2 Strategies team. Uh, we run the State Support Center, um, as well as the Green Inclusive Finance team. And uh, we work on Inflation Reduction Act implementation, tax credits, and uh, every, every sort of uh, financing across the board. I'm so excited to be with you all and with our wonderful panelists. We will kick off with a little bit of a, what seems to be a uh, confusion or a debate uh, over the size of uh, the uh, smallest use of the loan programs office of CEFI. There was some talk about, is it 100 million? Um, Molly and, and the RMI team had uh, indicated best practice maybe to think of it as 150 or 130 million. So we'll go first to Hans here um, with the authoritative voice on, on this question. Thank you. Uh, well, there is not a statutory minimum. Uh, there can be a practical minimum because LPO's financing has requirements like NEPA. And NEPA might be a challenge that would cause a certain kind of project to be a multi-year project. Uh, for example, um, Davis-Bacon, uh, other requirements that we have. So we generally find that applicants tell us that it starts to pencil out more when the loan request is 100 million and above, but recognizing that we'll only cover a share of the project. We might at maximum cover 80%, but it's probably less. So your total project size might be 130, 150. Now, our tribal program, might be it does do smaller loans our, our vehicles program could so always please just talk to us you know to get a, a definitive answer lovely when in doubt call doe call hans call the lpo um, but molly not to um 
put you on the spot here, but uh, anything you want to add on the recommended way of thinking about uh, the size of a, of a potential loan programs office uh, loan? Yeah, just um, two quick things. One, that there are also administrative fees associated with like not just the kind of opportunity cost, but like real um, advisors that you have to hire and things. Um, so that's the other reason the scale is bigger, but also want to flag the, you know, really exciting um, Cephi as a borrower structure that um, both Hans and others have spoken about and CPE has a great resource on um, for those projects under a hundred 130, 100, you know, whatever, if you have enough smaller projects to hit that scale where it starts making sense and you have an SPV that's willing to aggregate those and, and um, work with all of those, then it's still definitely worth it. But yes, echoing talk to Hans, I think always willing to have a conversation. Excellent. Um, very good. Well, I'd like to go over to, to, to Yakov here and ask a, a question about um, using special purpose vehicles. Someone asked in the chat, what is a special purpose vehicle? Um, which I think we've answered. Uh, it's a LLC used to expressly own and operate a project like this or a, or a aggregation of projects. But um, if you're a state that's looking to use an SPV to do solar on schools, as we've heard um, Abby's leadership, you know, Pennsylvania is working to do, um, how much of the project costs are likely to be covered by tax credits um, or direct pay? And then also, how hard is it to get each additional bonus layer of credits? Because uh, as folks on, who have dug in on, on the tax credit world will know, um, many of the credits are eligible for bonus adders for energy communities, low income uh, bonuses, uh, domestic content, as well as uh, uh, prevailing wage uh, and apprenticeship requirements, which can go up or down. Uh, so over to you, Yakov, to take the first cut at that. And then maybe Abby, if you want to chime in there as well. Sure. So there, first of all, just to level set, elective pay is a new way of monetizing tax credits that lets public entities and nonprofit entities receive the tax credit as a direct cash payment from the IRS upon the completion of the project. And it could be done using various credits, including the ITC and the PTC. Our analysis has shown that usually with the projects we we're speaking about, ITC is kind of where you want to go. Um, so one, again, these credits have bonuses and penalties. Um, for a aggregated project, this gets particularly complicated because the credits are issued against what's referred to as an energy property rather than a collection of projects. Um, there is still some regulatory clarification we're looking for from the IRS as to where the boundaries of an energy property are drawn. So in some cases, the IRS is may be allowing you to group together certain projects uh, as one due to how they link to a transformer. Sometimes they don't, but because you're dealing with multiple projects, you're dealing with these cash injections coming from the IRS coming in at different times and very importantly, in different sums. And this is, I think, where the meat of the question comes in. Some bonuses are relatively easy to get because they're basically based on location. Um, other bonuses are harder to get because they are bonuses you have to apply pre-apply for. Like, uh, for, uh, for example, one of the larger ones, which is the uh, where the electrons are going, bonus, as I like to call it, or low-income service, uh, is one you have to pre-apply for, and there's kind of a competitive process. Um, given that you're already applying for CEFI, you're probably getting wage and apprenticeship, so uh, right to begin with. So you are at a base of 30% to begin with for the investment tax credit. Um, there are domestic content requirements 
on the elective pay, which are different from the way they work for regular tax credits in that they are a requirement that gets you as much as they are a bonus, um, which means over the years, the uh, tax credit goes down in value and then it completely disappears if you don't hit uh, domestic content. The good news is it looks like Treasury is being relatively good at clarifying how to get that bonus and how to, and creating exemptions. Um, so it depends on the project site. Um, I will say, I think the majority, especially if you're using LPO rather than tax exempt municipal debt, you will hit at least your 30% on each project. The other advantage on the SPV structure of aggregating these tax credit collections is the SPV internally will be able to dedicate some of its capital to financing the projects up front and then getting paid back through the tax credit structure, which is usually the barrier municipalities and other public entities have to using elective pay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Um, Answer wonderful. <laughs> Great, great um, high level answer. And and Abby, um, over to you, the resident uh, user here, state state leader using the program. Um, can you share uh, what role can a, a CEPI like PETA uh, have in assisting localities uh, with accessing the tax credit incentives available for, for uh, CEPI clean energy projects? And anything you wanna add also on uh, what Yakov uh, shared as well in the prior answer. Sure. Yeah. So Yakov covered that perfectly. Every uh, the more he talked, the more I crossed off my mental talking points. So um, one thing I can share is like the a need in Pennsylvania that we recognized is um, projects that come through us as a CEPI or not. Um, you know, we want as much benefit from the IRA coming to Pennsylvania, and that's not just you know these program dollars, but also the incentives like the tax credits. But you know, there's, you know, 2000 plus municipalities in Pennsylvania, and a lot of their capacity is limited to even understand what direct pay means or, um, you know, and how to how to approach the IRS. So we're standing up a service bureau where we would help uh, instrumentalities of the Commonwealth. So that's um, counties and municipalities and schools um, apply for tax credits and kind of the idea is to be like H and R Block, where they can come work, come through us to file their project. We'll give them that tax credit up front, and then once we file for the tax credit, it'll it'll actually just come through IRS back to PETA. So um, that's a a resource we are trying to stand up to make sure all of these incentives that are eligible, um, you know, hit the right bank accounts and and make the most impact impact and we don't want to see capacity at the local level be a barrier for that. So, um, you know, we, we put out an RFI to get a contract together to to stand up this service bureau and we should be you know, put more out publicly soon on that. But I think that's one example of how other states can be thinking about um, making sure these incentives for clean energy projects, um, you know, hit the bank accounts of the people who are doing this work. Amazing. Uh, we, we love RFIs. Speaking of RFIs, um, Greg, uh, you shared with us the breadth of responses that you got um, in collaborating across two state offices at uh, in, in the state government of, of Arizona. So I want to turn to you here. And can you share some uh, more examples of state agencies or offices that could collaborate on CEFI finance projects? Sure. In the process of of bringing out the RFI, we worked with Arizona Commerce Authority, which is kind of the economic development or um, arm of the state. So they go out and try to find companies and bring companies in. If you've heard of TSMC, they were kind of involved around that. Um, the others are Department of Transportation is another one that obviously works on large projects um, and they have a, a number of federal you know, money coming in. Um, and then the other one is the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority, which is kind of a it's a quasi government arm that receives again federal money it's kind of a called a bond bank for water infrastructure projects and so they're you know 
heavily involved in anything that happens you know statewide um, they have both grants and loans so they kind of do a, you know both uh, both of those and again water is such a large part of um, our infrastructure not necessarily our needs but just you know that that plays a role in anything that comes here um, is you know is there water where is the water going to come from so those are probably the biggest areas um, and then we just we kind of talk to our, you know, our federal liaison to see what, you know, their, what's going on from their perspective and local agencies like uh, Greater Phoenix Economic Council is another economic development arm. So when we receive some of these projects, we would send them to them so they can help locate and, and work on, on not necessarily the finance side, but just the location side of things. Wonderful. Um, in other words, use your imagination here. Uh, let's pull in uh, offices that that may not you may not think of initially, but a um, lot of opportunity to do that. Uh, again, on the topic of RFIs and with the uh, uh, example RFI that Shirag shared, um, his boss Paul is on the line. I think has some other thoughts on uh, opportunities that a request for information uh, can present. Thanks, friends. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to you know add a few things connect some dots here on, on um, what, what Greg was saying about the different kind of entities that can um, put out RFIs and, and just be in touch with uh, different actors across your state that are um, interested in, in initiating projects. So we've seen all sorts of different types of agencies across the country do these kinds of RFIs. So, you know, in New York State, for example, the New York Power Authority, which is a public utility, um, did an RFI and, and a follow-up RFQ process to start kind of qualifying uh, potential development partners to explore um, uh, creating a project pipeline with them. Uh, they obviously work in coordination with agencies like NYSERDA and New York Green Bank. Um, and then we see agencies in uh, Arizona, like, like Greg's Arizona Finance Authority, and also New Mexico's Economic Development Department today put out um, an RFI um, seeking projects. They put out kind of a series of RFIs uh, for a, a, a litany of different types of projects that would make use of uh, IRA tools, including energy generation, but a number of other things as well. Um, and so what I really want to highlight is, you know, if if this is um, if this feels overwhelming, an RFI really is a great, um, easier first step to just get a kind of 10,000 foot landscape view of what are the, who are the various actors in my state who are aware of these tools and are interested in doing things that might be aligned with our interests as an agency. And um, perhaps you know some of them, but perhaps there are others that you do not know yet. Um, and you can get a really great landscape view just by putting out this document and and getting some responses from your private sector and your municipalities and 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 so on. And a lot of times um, from the responses that you get, that can start to lead you in a direction of, oh, there are some um, CEPI eligible ideas out here that I might be able to help with, or I don't have CEPI eligible ideas, but there are some potential elective pay projects where I could help out. Um, you know, just having that landscape in front of you can really help you um, start to see what tools in your tool belt you might be able to deploy uh, uh, to help this process along. Yeah, I just want to shout out the New Mexico effort that's just started out. Um, th I think they've done incredible work. And one thing they're doing, which I think other states also have done, but I really want to highlight is even before they put out the RFI, they've been in putting on interagency and agency county convenings and just understanding the IRA landscape and sourcing the various expertise and interest across uh, their state government as part of uh, booting this up. And I think that's going to be really successful because they're really trying to put together an all state effort, all state government effort to use all of these things together and the best place they can and talking to one another. So really, like, I think that's a great example of how you can begin this process. Awesome. And I just saw that they uh, dropped some some hot info announcing uh, that the RFA dropped today. So congrats to the uh, New Mexico EMNRD team uh, for that. Um, very exciting. And 
hope they get uh, as many submissions as you, Greg. Um, so next, I want to uh, go to this concept of, of a, a toolkit and uh, really kind of the broader uh, landscape as well. So it, uh, if CEFI is part of a broader toolkit, uh, what are state leaders' roles in working with other LPO programs or federal tools? So, Molly, why don't we start with you, um, and then uh, we'll go to Hans. Yeah, great. So um, I said this in the chat or in the Q&A in response, but um, one of my colleagues is actually working on um, an EIR program um, playbook for states, which is also going to be released this week. So we certainly are trying to think about uh, supporting states across the spectrum of um, LPO's financing programs. Um, I'll say, obviously, the state officials that we normally work with are going to have a slightly different role with EIR applications compared to CEFI applications, because obviously they don't have to, they're not co-investors, they aren't creating a, their own program. Um, so it's mostly going to be project developers working directly with LPO. That being said, um, and you can read a lot more about this in the EIR playbook, but um, there are certain regulators in a state that can kind of directly influence uptake. Uh, for example, a utility regulator could require that EIR um, and, and other federal incentives be accounted for in utility planning processes. Um, sometimes states you know, own and operate energy infrastructure directly. And in those cases, obviously they can um, use it for their own electricity generation, but um, the playbook that we pulled together is more about the indirect work that state agencies can do, raising awareness about EIR, educating potential applicants, um, using their convening power to um, kind of connect key decision makers, uh, and then facilitating really strong EIR applications, especially around community benefit plans. Um, so happy to talk more about that if folks are interested. Um, but in, our main priority with EIR is making sure that that financing is being used for what we're calling high impact applications. So making sure that it's going towards projects that um, would not or could not have happened without that EIR financing. Um, so really filling kind of a needed gap where the private sector um, doesn't exist. So. That's our high level priority, but um, yeah, I'll make sure that the EIR playbook is also posted on our event page. Wonderful, and and Hans, uh, as as you prepare to answer this as well, I saw you dropped your the LPO CEFI toolkit from the Department of Energy into the chat, and um, we'll pick that up. Um, but also, can you, as you're doing this, share some more examples of projects that uh, qualify and projects that don't um, as you're as you're going through this. Sure, yeah, I put into the chat the link to the CEFI toolkit, as well as the name and email for uh, myself and my colleagues. There are three of us who work very closely with states um, across the country, and so please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> so the, the question is to what kinds of projects? There are, you know, LPO can finance projects in a wide array of sectors. We can do industrial decarbonization. So perhaps your state wants to help companies and industries modernize and compete in a decarbonizing global economy where consumers are looking for more sustainable products. Uh, your economic development authority could provide incentives for companies doing decarbonization. Those project those companies might be able to borrow from LPO. Uh, building decarbonization, it could have affordable housing owners could come in for energy projects across their entire portfolio of buildings. You could have, or even multiple entities, dozens of, you know, many dozens of buildings that do heat pump replacement and uh, renewables and EV charging uh, across all those properties. Uh, they could potentially come in to LPO. You could, we've talked a fair amount about the states accumulating portfolios of, for example, solar on schools or libraries, fire stations, rec centers. Uh, that's a really interesting 
model as well. We've talked about fleets. You know, there could be uh, support for EV bus fleet transition or uh, local governments that want to replace gas powered vehicle fleets with energy uh, with with EV. Um, there are lots of lots of possibilities. You, the project needs to show a uh, significant greenhouse gas reduction from the kind of industry standard, the base case. And then of course you have to have the state, if it's a CEFI project, the state is a uh, meaningful investor. I did wanna just salute uh, Pennsylvania again on the um, EIR strategy that they've recently embarked upon where they are looking for project developers on their abandoned mine land. So abandoned mine land is potentially, if it's coal mine land, it's potentially an energy site, which potentially qualifies it under our EIR program. So states have a lot of geographies that might be um, eligible geographies for LPO under EIR, and they can get out there and find companies that want to locate manufacturing facilities or uh, other kinds of investments on that property. And the state could offer an economic development incentive LPO can offer long-term financing. So there's lots of ways to, you know, uh, access LPO's financing. Many ways and many projects. And Greg, thank you for the wide breadth of uh, projects that you shared that came back from the RFI. Um, anything else you want you want to share on types of projects that, that you've seen come in that are particularly exciting or novel? Nothing in particular. We've we've seen some interesting. I call you know a lot of battery projects that I th I found. You know, I, that's, I don't know if that's novel, but it, it seemed interesting. And of course, solar is predominant, but uh, also the water and kind of sludge. You know, taking um, taking the sludge that comes through and and turning that into energy. That's another project of that's pretty interesting. Nice. And as a reminder, you know, the CEFI provision allows you to uh, use LPO's money to finance commercialized technologies. So it can be, you know, big, big portfolios of uh, solar or very, uh, very well proven technologies. Uh, we did get a, mess, a, a question in the chat here from Erica. We have regulatory barriers created by legacy technologies defending their market edge under the guide of safety. How much support is there for uh, overcoming regulatory challenges? Uh, Shirag, do you do you want to take that one? Can we go to you on that? Yeah. So you know, depending on the depending on the energy project, there may be a number of either market, technological, or regulatory hurdles in order to give that project an easier path to bankability. Right. Put another way, if the LPO is able to offer a loan of a certain size. Are there other factors that can be dealt with that make it easier for that project to get across the finish line all, all else equal? And I think on a lot of them, there is significant appetite, particularly because we now have tools like the LPO guarantees or the tax credits that exist and create a push factor for investment to move forward. Many of these uh, kind of push factors, for example, state climate initiatives, ma mandates, targets, and interest existed before IRA and got accelerated afterwards. But the fact that this money helps, I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, one is the effort at the state level, the ISO RTO level, and even in Congress to think about tackling challenges on, for example, transmission and distribution, right? There's been a lot of interest in dealing with, for example, interconnection barriers that may prevent large or small solar and storage installations from getting connected, right? That's that's just one uh, that's just one example. There are entities uh, at the state level, including, for example, in, in this webinar, who are interested in uh, facilitating the technical capability of state offices to engage with these tools, put out these RFIs, think in development spaces um, as well. As are groups uh, hoping to alter state statutes and the like to enable more state institutions to take advantage of these provisions and execute the kind of operations, equity equity issuance, for example, uh, that might allow them to participate. So there, there is a lot of movement, and I encourage uh, participants on this webinar 
um, attendees, as well as in particular if they're from state institutions, to think about what kinds of barriers your offices or your state environments might face uh, to access some of these, um, you know, uh, and and do some outreach to see if there are, there there are folks who can help you work work through them. Um, you know, CP is one such office, as are others. Uh, on this webinar, but we certainly can um, think about who might be best to put you in touch uh, with for those efforts. Fantastic. And with that, um, I will move to close here. Um, first of all, thank you to all the amazing panelists for your insights, uh, your knowledge, your wisdom, and sharing. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees uh, for tuning in and your great questions and leadership. Uh, we will follow up with all of the materials that have been mentioned here. Uh, so looking forward to uh, you know, continuing the conversation that started today. And I really encourage you to take these insights, go back to your, uh, your, your states, go back to your, uh, your organizations and, and put them to use um, for the betterment of, of all of us. Um, and Godspeed. Thank you, everybody, for your time this, this afternoon. Have a, have a lovely day. Thank you.